Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today I'm talking about Dead Wish Runtime 9, which is mad because I'm pretty sure 8 only just came out. And I was having a look around last week doing some training for a client, and Dead Wish Runtime 9 beta was there. And I was like, oh, oh, what? Well, there's a beta already? And then I went today to do a video, and it's GA. It's, it is live, it is out, and I'm super confused at the pace that things are going currently. So we're going to take a step through Daedric's Runtime 9. We're going to have a look what's in there. Some interesting stuff like the Summarize function, which is like a fancy described function. Uh, we'll have a look at Autoloader with images. So a really nice, neat, optimized way of being able to just throw images and have it automatically passed and brought into your lake and optimized in a Delta table, which is really, really cool. And then there's a whole load of other feature improvements, libraries, normal stuff that we see in a runtime. So loads of things to step through and have a bit of a chat about. Uh, before we get onto it, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments if you're interested in anything, if there's a bit I've missed, if there's a particular library that's changed in the runtime, keep an eye out because it is a major version shift. So there might be some backward compatibility changes because that's the time when it can happen when we're moving between these major versions. Um, other bits and pieces, the training that we're doing before Big Day London is still out in the open. We're also doing some training around uh, Synapse, the whole Synapse workspace as a bootcamp uh, that's happening in October. So lots of different things going up. I'll put some links uh, down below for those. If you're going for the Big Data London pre-training stuff, don't forget we do have the Beacon 10 discount code that you can go and use. And I can't be bothered putting a little flash. We'll do it in a later video. It'll be fine. Go watch the last video, you'll figure it out. Cool. Let's go and have a look at the runtime. Okay, so... Normal stuff, we've got release notes, so Dedevix Runtime 9 and Dedevix Runtime 9 Photon. And again, that is hinting towards where we're basically going to be seeing that Photon available on normal clusters, not just hidden away in the Dedevix SQL um, querying dashboarding environment, which you might still not have access to. So, should be seeing that soon. If you don't have access to it yet, then hold your horses, you will see it at some point, being able to see... Essentially, when you spin up a normal interactive cluster, do you want it a normal cluster? Do you want a photon cluster? And it's now an option that you'll be able to see going forwards. So, what else is going on in the world? What have we got? So, got a list of new features. I'm not going to step through the bug fixes, library upgrades, Spark, because there is so much in there. As always, I advise you guys to have a look through that yourselves. Um, but the stuff that we're going to see. So, first and first, this new API for the summary statistics of datasets. So what can we do with that? So got a little data frame, jumped on one of the Databricks data sets. Nothing particularly crazy there. Let's go and quickly do that. I've only just turned the cluster on, so it might take a moment to figure out what it's doing. So we've had this function, dataframe.describe, which always kind of messed with my head because I'm used to using the Spark table, the SQL table describe function, which just goes, this is the schema of the table, which is nice and it's super useful, but it doesn't really tell you much about the table, just a simple, here are your columns and data types. Now the data frame describe function is slightly different. That's actually going to do some data profiling and gives a little bit of information about it. Um, but again, it's not that deep. Right, it helps if I actually display that, doesn't it? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so we do this. We could put dot display at the end. Okay. So basically doing describe turns the data frame into a descriptive version of itself and we get this kind of thing. So we get counts, mediums, standard deviations, min, maxes for lots of the different columns. And it's it's okay, it's kind of useful. Doesn't tell us too much, but kind of nice. So this new thing that we've got is essentially a much, much, much better version of that. So we can now go dbutils.data.summarize with a Z. Ugh and then pop that data frame in and that's going to make a much more descriptive slightly interactive um data profiling report for us and there used to be versions of that that you could use out in spark but they never really got upgraded with spark 3 and then he had some errors and they kind of wasn't particularly great okay so we get this thing so first and first we get this split of numerical features and categorical features so we can see our numerical features in that data set We've got three different ones that were uh int based the percentage of nulls, mean, standard deviations, percentage of zeros in there, minimum, uh, medium, maximum, just some general nice bits of stats. And we get the categorical ones. So we can say missing unique. So 
So not just the straight count, but also the unique count is always good. The frequency distributions. We actually get a nice understanding of the actual distribution that we're dealing with. Uh, we can have a play around with some of this stuff and go, actually, I want quantiles for my numerical ones. And we can kind of tweak and play with that, and it's kind of nice. Uh, having to play around this stuff is quite nice as well. So we can choose what are the different data types I want to see. So we can kind of just enable and disable different parts of that. I just want to see the strings. You've got a massive data set. Okay, no, I'm just looking for destination. Okay, and the type down's really quick, really responsive. And yeah, it's quite nice. What order do I want things in? So if I've got all my things coming, do I want to sort it by how weird they are, how alphabetical, the number of missing to find out what's the most problematic column I'm going to uh, have in there. It's quite nice. So that is a new tool. So it is a new area of the dbutils um, library, I guess. Uh, and it's only got summarized in there. Now, the docs are a little confusing because uh, it points to the credentials utility. Uh, what it actually means is it's the next thing down after the credentials utility. You've got this data utility. And then you can go in there and you've got the details about it. Summarize how you use it. Little example of the commands. All that kind of good stuff is in there. So feature number one coming out strong with Databricks Runtime 9. Just a nice, useful data profiling tool that's baked into Databricks. You just grab it, any old data frame, pass it to the dbutils.data.summarize, and then it'll give you some nice feedback. Currently only available in Scala and Python, but again, you can always just put it via SQL and kind of uh, put it into Scala or Python if you're using R or SQL or whatever you're happy to be doing. Okay, other bits and pieces. So data source configuration with Azure Synapse. So you can now reuse existing external data sources. So if Synapse has already been set up to be talking to a blob storage or an AD last gen two, you can actually just say, just use your existing one rather than pass credentials in. Just some, it's good to see that relationship improving because they're kind of occasionally seen as competitors, but they do just work better if you do a lot of stuff in Databricks and then you can query it from Synapse and then you can make some stuff in Synapse and query it from Databricks. The closer those two are to each other, the better for us as users of that whole ecosystem. So it's good to see that improving. Uh, a few little ones, so like you can limit the session uh, duration when you're talking to Redshift. That's not something I've ever used. I never really go there. I'm in uh, Azure land. But I'm sure there is uh, use for that. Don't know what's driven that, whether it's left sessions open for a long, long time and people had to close them manually. You ran out of uh, concurrency slots. I don't know. That is a Redshift thing. Okay, Parquet improvements. So it's shifted up a version of Parquet. So Parquet is itself its own open source um, standard. And there's just a load of changes in there. So you can go and have a dig through the version 1.12 and kind of see things in there. They mainly are around the integration of things like Bloom filter indexes. So it's performance. So you should see some improvements in performance if you're using things like Bloom filter indexes and, and you're trying to improve data skipping and just generally make your queries faster. Hollow debugs fixed, hollow stuff. Again, like all the other big low level detail things, I'll leave you guys to go and have a dig through that. And then we can talk about autoloader. Now, I mean, if you guys have been watching the channel for a while, you should know that I love autoloader. I use it quite a lot. Yes, there are some weird issues when you want to reload files, but generally it's quite cool and it just simplifies some stuff. Um, so one thing, big old um, space saving in terms of the work it has to do. Each time it's doing a little micro batch the amount of work it has to do to work out what files it should be pulling back, they've optimized it for anything that is using some kind of nested directory structure. So things like S3 buckets, things like ADLS Gen 2, things like Google Cloud Storage. If something's using, so in Azure, that's hierarchical namespace based. So if you have a folder object and then files inside it, it can actually just pull that out better because it used to basically just try and get all subdirectories at once and just have a flood of data. Um, so that's good. Generally makes things faster and better. Um, but the interesting one is these two. So the ability to use autoloader over binary files and actually it pass images properly, properly. Um, so again, autoloader is this whole tool set that streams data from some kind of cloud storage. So we can put it over a blob storage directory in Azure and say, watch this file. And as soon as a file comes in, it sends a little message using event grid into a, um, a storage queue. And then autoload is just ingesting from that queue and goes, oh, there's a new file I need to load, goes to the actual files, loads it in. So it's a way of doing low latency file streaming 
into Spark. You can also use it as a, as a batch process by setting the trigger to once and then just telling it, run now, run now, and it'll get anything it's done since the last time it ran. So that's, that is cool. But the ability to do it is using image files and actually have it pass the images properly and display the images, as well as storing them in an optimized format in the Delta table is, is quite cool. So we've got an example of that. So let's have a look at this. So I'm setting up autoloader first. So autoloader is going to have to go and talk to Azure, create an event grid, create a blob storage queue. So it needs certain configuration things. Now this demo, basically I took the demo I did last time about schema drift and I've had to just pull all of that out. So you can't use any of the schema drift stuff when you're using binary files. So I've had to kind of simplify this to just, here's your connection details so you can go and talk to Azure. Using infercom types, I don't think that even does anything with the binary files. I'm telling it how to talk to blob storage because it's going to have to go and actually have access to this space in blob store. And then I can tell it, go and read that directory. So do I have that directory looking around anyway? It would help if I could show you that. Let me just get that over here. So I've just got a, a real simple blob store where I've just thrown a few image files. So we can just have a look at what image files are in there currently. So actually while I'm doing this, I'm going to start that stream. So in this case, I'm not writing it down to a Delta table. They have improved how you can write images into a Delta table. Uh, for now, I'm just going to show you quickly that we can pull back this uh, instant list of things and actually see it working. So there we go. It can display. We should see some records in a second. Thinking about it. Um, there we go. Well, what we're actually going to see is this blob store. So I've got this gallery folder. It's got a load of images, mix of JFIFs and JPEGs, JPEGs, uh, and that should come through. Okay, so we'll go back here. There we go. We've got a load of images coming through and we have people's pictures. So this is the AA team. We can kind of just have this live view of the team just in a display window hanging around. Now that's, that's not everybody. I need to add some more people in. So I'm going to add, uh, let's see, what can we do? You know, add a picture down into the bottom of it. I've got it knocking around. Here we go. So I think it needs this photo. Okay, we can load that in. So I'm going to add that photo into my blob store. Let's just do a quick upload. I grab it into here. There we go. So I'm going to add in a little photo of me. So that's now uploaded. So that has gone into autoloader. You can see that picture's in there now. And then if we go in here, in a few seconds, we'll see this update because it is doing that live file stream. So it's going to have landed in blob storage, triggered an event grid thing, gone into that queue, auto load it each time it finishes a micro batch, which is defaulting to 10 seconds. It's going to go in and there we go. It's found that picture. So live image streaming into the Spark ecosystem and into Delta tables is what this release is about. So that whole piece, that whole auto loader functionality just lets us do things like that. So if you're trying to augment your data with visuals, if you're trying to build some quite smart looking dashboarding thing and you need pictures of your products, if you're trying to do um, like nice image inference and you're trying to do some essentially machine learning based on images, you can just have this generic drop folder, have people drop images in and have it stream directly into your ecosystem, which is kind of cool. So yeah, we got that now. Uh, the other part is directory rename events. So it used to be autoloader wouldn't if you renamed a folder that files lived in, Autoloader would go, yeah, I don't care, fine. It's only if you, originally it was only when you created a new file. Then they added the functionality, so if you rename a file, it'll then trigger a message and you can get Autoloader to treat that as a new file. And now they've added the direct directory rename. So if you rename a, a whole folder, then we can trigger the resending of all files in that folder. Which again, super useful if we need to do that kind of things. Especially if we need to reload a month we can just rename that month folder and it'll push everything through again and we can kind of manage updates that way. Okay, so that's a lot of autoloader stuff. Lots of interesting things going on. Uh, other things happening. So we've got some SQL improvements. And I like I like the fact that we now have the SQL area in there because it used to be they'd just be jammed into the rest of the generic Spark stuff. But if we're seeing kind of a separate little feature list of here's some cool stuff we've done in Spark, in SQL or Spark SQL, then it kind of keeps allows us to keep an eye on things. And, you know, if you're coming from a mature SQL environment, some of these are like, well done. Um, but it's really good to see because the closer we get to that mature SQL environment through Spark, then actually the better these things are going to be. So it's always good to see. 
anytime there's a data bridge runtime that's got Spark, uh, Spark SQL improvements, I'm a happy boy anyway. So do think about this. We go select star except columns. Kind of useful. So if you just want to, so say if you were having schema drift happening and you wanted any new file and new columns coming in to be included, but you don't want to have to do a select star because you know there's some things you definitely don't want to see, then you can say select star except these things. And that way, if the underlying tables change, if new data is added, that will still be returned. You've got this dynamic view that's going to be bringing more and more and more stuff back, but you don't have to include things you don't want to do. If you had like system audits things, if you had some generated hashes that you don't want to expose to the users, you can do select star except for this list of stuff. Obviously, I know a lot of SQL people who would be just looking in horror if you had a select star anywhere, but it's fine. We're in the dynamic schema drift land now, but... We'll see. It's a debate for another day. Um, next thing we do is SQL scalar functions. And again, another interesting one. And it's like poking the bear of the traditional SQL environment because scalar functions are known to perform terribly in a traditional SQL environment. Now, I really want to dig into this one because when we're dealing with uh, custom functions that run on a cell by cell basis in Spark, there's a lot of danger in terms of doing your own ones, normally known as uh, user-defined functions, UDFs. And if you write them in Scala, they're generally all right because that can run inside the JVM and that's quite performant. But if you write them in Python or in R, then they run outside of the JVM and you need to go via the interrupt and it's just absolutely horrendously slow. And they came out with all this work with the pandas vectorized UDFs to use Apache Arrow, making it slightly more efficient by sending blocks of data over um, but it's still not as good as just having it running natively in, in the Spark executor. Uh, so I am really curious here in terms of the SQL scalar function. Where's that running? Is that performant? Does that work? Is that actually a nice option for the people who are building their lake house type things using Python? And they don't want to have to write bits and pieces of Scala if they need a UDF. So would that work performantly? Is that going to run natively on the Spark engine? Does that require us to be using the new Photon version of it to work? I don't know. I don't have any of the details behind that, but I am curious because that's a, could be a really nice option for being able to do UDFs in a performant way rather than having to build something in Scala, register it as a UDF so it's then available to SQL. Options, things we can do. So yeah, lots to look into there. Uh, we can do essentially correlated subqueries. We can do a lateral um, join now. So we can say, I want to laterally join to this table, add a subquery. And the main thing is being able to refer to aliases because sometimes Spark SQL is not being very good at aliases. So if I've got this, a table that I've aliased and then I'm inside a subquery and I want to refer to that parent alias, uh, that's just generally not being a Sparky thing. You can do it in normal SQL, which now you can. So you can actually have subqueries that refer in a join to the large one. That's quite useful, very useful technique. So we do that kind of thing. So you've now got that lateral keyword that we can now use for different join types if we actually need to go and do filters based on parent things outside of the context of that subquery. Yeah, makes sense. Fun. Okay, other bits and pieces. So notebook scoped R libraries. So we saw things like, you know, we've seen percentage pip percentage conda for doing notebook scoped Python libraries, allowing you to do the same thing with R is super, super useful. Um, they've made our messages warnings better, which is good. Um, and they've made the streaming stateful processing slightly better for us. There's better compatibility with things like specifying the starting point. So useful. Again, I don't write a lot of R. I don't do a lot of streaming in R. If I was doing that, I'd generally be doing it in Python anyway. But I'm sure a lot of people who are R native trying to do this kind of stuff, getting feature parity across all these languages just helps everyone out. And that's it. So there's obviously a ton of library upgrades, lots of interesting ones in there. Seeing some of the upgrades around so some of the visualization tools you might use, like uh, Seaborn things in there, Pyaro, you've got obviously the Parquet ones, lots of interesting things going up. Again, be a little careful if you're relying heavily on some of those things, because that's where some of the breaking backwards compatibility can come in. If you're shifting major uh, Databricks runtime versions, don't just upgrade your cluster, make a separate cluster with the new runtime version, test your work, and then trash it if it doesn't work. You can test these things in isolation. That's the joy of separation of compute from script from storage. So test these things before you use it, right? A lot of other things. So it's going up to Spark 3.12. So it is changing Spark version under the hood as well. And there's lots of things in there in terms of bug fixes, upgrades, all that stuff. 
this isn't going to be a half hour video when I talk through every single bug list in there because there's so many of them. Lots and lots of stuff going on. Again, I advise you to take a look through, familiarize yourself, see if there's any of the bugs that you've raised with the Spark ecosystem or things that have, you've been kind of working around with for so often. And it's really nice, this kind of major shift <laughs> when suddenly you'll see, oh, the thing that's been plaguing me for the last two years is now fixed. So loads of interesting bugs in there, loads of interesting upgrades, loads of interesting changes of behavior from the Spark ecosystem. Those amazing set of contributors who've been doing lots of stuff. <sighs> and yeah, that's it. That is just, just a short little giant pile of stuff that's appeared in Deadworks Runtime 9.0. So again, that should be there. You should be able to log on to Deadworks and go and see it. So certainly for me, when I was digging around, we can see it is now just available, not even marked as a beta release. It is a GA release of Deadworks Runtime 9.0. Go and have a play, go and work with it. And that is all I really wanted to talk about today. So lots and lots of stuff in there. Some really, really cool features. Certainly the idea of being able to have this live stream version of images always going in, and but only doing it whenever there is a new image added using the, the nice notification queue elements of um, autoloader. So some really nice, really, really cool stuff in there. And yeah, that's it. go take a look, go check it out. And let me know, as always, what do you think? Any features in there that actually change how you're working? Anything in there you're like, ah, I cannot wait to get to grips with that. What do you think of the summarize function? Are you guys currently using any open source libraries that do the same thing that you can now go, well, actually, we don't need to go and plug an extra library and we can just use it straight off the shelf. Let me know down in the comments. As always, if you haven't already, hit that like button, hit subscribe if you're not a subscriber, and I'll catch you guys next time. Cheers.